Let's get started. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us this evening for the first in a very special series on really helping our children to grow in their mental health and function better and stay in control in an ever-changing world. This is our very first event for this year. And the topic of tonight is self-harm, what to do if your child is cutting. I have been working with teenagers for over 25 years, and I have seen many, many interesting, inspiring, and scary things that teenagers do, preteens and teenagers. And one of the most confusing behaviors that we can see in teens is self-harm. So with that said, um, I would first like to, um, I would like to mention that tonight's evening is sponsored and produced by Operation Survival. Um, it is an event that we have done yearly. Um, I'd like to thank COL Live and Crown Heights Info for streaming the event. And I'd like to thank Yaakov Behrman for coordinating the event, as well as Miriam Simon. To jump right into it, I want to share a story with you this evening of a young woman that I worked with many years ago. And she, in the course of a conversation that we were having in high school, she mentioned to me that she was cutting herself. And at the time, this was such a foreign concept to me that I didn't know what to do with it. And I've always tried to relate to my students through my personal experiences, but here I was really stumped and I had no choice but to ask. So I said, why would a person intentionally hurt themselves? I just couldn't understand. And what she told me was a real eye-opener. She said, a few years ago, I went through a very serious trauma. And in order to deal with the trauma, because I didn't know I needed counseling, my parents didn't know about my trauma, I didn't share it with them. So I completely shut down. My emotions were very intense and I just needed to shut everything off. So I turned off my emotions. My mind was racing, replaying the trauma over and over and over. So I, so I needed to shut off my mind and my body hurt. So I needed to shut that off as well. And as a result, I stopped feeling, I stopped learning. I stopped experiencing life. And then I became a teenager and I watched my friends, my classmates, I watched them as they were feeling and thinking and experiencing life as I was not. And I wanted to be a part of it, but I didn't know how. I couldn't have that. And then one day I was preparing some food in the kitchen and I cut my finger and it hurt and it bled and I could feel the pain and see the blood. And I cried out in the pain. And that was such a great moment in my life that I decided that I was going to try to repeat that moment over and over again. And then maybe my life would return back to normal. So I cut in order to feel and to know I'm human and to experience life. As we say very often, we quote Perke Avais, we qu quote the Mishnah that says, I have learned a lot from my teachers and more from my colleagues, but from my students, I have learned the most of all. And I must say that that applies so, so aptly to the situation where this student was, show was telling me and teaching me about cutting. Of course, her life did not return back to normal from cutting and she did end up getting the help she needed. 
And happily today, she is a trauma therapist helping others who suffered the way that she did. We're in the time of Svira Sa'omer and we are in the period of the week of Teferis. Teferis is beauty, balance, compassion. We are in the evening of Yudzayin ER, I'm sorry, we are in the evening of, of Bez ER, Yudzayin in the Omer, the, the 17th of, day of the Omer. And it is Teferis Shabbat Teferis. It is the compassion of compassion, the balance of balance. This is the trait that we work on in these 24 hours. And so it is extremely appropriate for us to be hearing from someone who is an expert in the field of compassion and who can help us as parents and educators be compassionate to our children and our students, all of our loved ones, and help them to be compassionate to themselves and come to a place of healing. We're also in the month of Eir, and the month of Eir is Ani Hashem Roif Echa. It represents, it is called the month of healing. So it is incredible Hashkacha practice that we are, that we are experiencing this event this evening. We are extremely fortunate to have with us tonight, Dr. Brad Reedy, who is the co-founder and executive clinical director of Evoke Therapy Programs. Which, is, which are an exper experiential programs for young people and their families who are struggling with mental health and addiction issues. With over 25 years of experience working with families on a liberating approach to the difficult task of parenting, he has written two books, The Journey of the Heroic Parent and The Audacity to Be You. I'll put the, the names of the books in the chat. He is also the host of the podcast, Finding You, an Evoke Therapy podcast. He is a much sought after guest contributor, lecturer, and speaker in the mental health field. And we were extremely blessed to have Dr. Reedy come to our community a few years ago and speak live. Unfortunately, COVID has hit and we don't have the blessing of having Dr. Reedy here with us personally, but he is going to give us everything he has here on Zoom tonight. Thank you very much, Dr. Reedy. Thank you for having me. And, and I miss being there in, in person. And I'm sure all of you miss being uh, together with loved ones more often than we're able to do these days. I'm going to tell you tonight, I'm, I'm very honored to be here, very honored to be asked to present to you. Anytime that I'm asked to speak to a group of parents, my heart automatically goes to a compassionate place because as you all know, I have four children myself and even under the best of conditions, parenting can be very, very challenging and, and can make us feel very alone. We spend so much of our time um, inside of the walls of our own home and, and we don't have access to other people for support for these very difficult and sometimes shameful topics. So I'm gonna try to do my best tonight to present a series of, of, of ideas that are related to this topic, but I'm also gonna talk about broadly about the, the mental health issues that come into play generally as we think about self-harm and cutting. Here's my outline. I'm gonna tell you what I'm gonna talk about tonight. First of all, I'm gonna talk about what to look for. I understand that there have been um, incidences of self-harm in your community. And so there's been some concern about this. So we're gonna talk about what to look for with your child in your home, with your students, with those that you, with the children that you're interacting with. I, I'm going to be clear to distinguish it between suicidality, between self-harm and suicidality, because one of the most common uh, fears that comes up when you find out about self-harm is that you can automatically equate it to suicide or suicidality, and that's not necessarily the case. So we'll talk about that in a couple of different places this evening. I'm going to talk about what causes it. I, one of the things that we we talk about first and foremost is trying to figure out um, where it comes from, what's the meaning. It is so strange and counterintuitive and off-putting, just like Dina was saying, that, that when, it, when we first encounter it, it's, it seems so other, so foreign to us. So I'll talk about what causes it. I'll talk about 
very simply how to talk about it. A lot of times I talk very conceptually about things, but the fact of the matter is we also need to know some basic skills. I'll talk about how to get help when, uh, how to find an expert. And then of course, if it rises to the level that you need hospitalization, what that looks like, what, 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 when you get to that level and, and how to reach out for help. And then overall, like I said, I wanna talk about the barriers to progress because so much of my work in dealing with young people is grounded in helping and inviting the parents to do their own work. Years ago, we still have a program full of young people that are struggling with mental health and addiction. But I found years ago that, that an hour with a parent was worth several hours with a child because you were really talking to somebody who was more motivated and who could carry the ideas, skills, principles going forward. So that's what I'm gonna cover this evening. When I teach a group of parents, those that are in crisis, I'll often start off with this first idea, which is um, a thought experiment for all of you. No matter where you are, if you're looking at this in terms of prevention, if you're looking at this, this because you're, you're in the, the difficult part of a, of a crisis or somebody that you care about is cutting, no matter where you are, I, I ask for this invitation while you're with us this evening, while we speak for the next hour or so. And the invitation is to consider the idea that you are not off course. So many times when our children struggle, we want and we look for and we, we wish for that we could be in another place, that, that we don't want to be taking this detour, that this is not what, what we expected. But what I have found, in fact, this is one of the principles that I'll talk about a little, little bit later with the treatment of self-harm. Um, one of the most important aspects is to be present in your situation. If you're present in your situation, if you can lean into it, then you also get access to the wisdom and the treasure that that lesson has to offer. Nobody, no parent that I've ever met would hope for this, for their child to be experiencing the kind of pain that would lead to self-harm. But if you find yourself in that position and, and you learn to be present with it, it will, just like Dina just shared, it will offer you great lessons. So many of the times when I meet these kids that are self-harming, my first thought that I have when, when I see evidence of it or they disclose it or it's in the paperwork upon admission, I think to myself, these are my people. These are the people who feel deeply and who will, will someday be able to reach back and help those that, that, that are also struggling with deep and big emotions. I wanna to read to you a quote and I'll give you some references at the end, but I wanna read, read you the quote of a father who had been dealing with his daughter's self-harm and, and the place that they were at after some effective treatment. He said this, he said, I remember the first time I had to say self-mutilation. I was so naive. I quickly learned all that the diagnosis entailed. It meant that my daughter and I would be at odds for her, for her teen, teen years. It meant late night emergency rooms and psychiatric wards. And for me, it meant anger, guilt, sadness, failure, hopelessness, loneliness. But mostly it meant fear. But slowly, ever so slowly, the rain stopped, the clouds lifted, and the sun was visible. It had been four and a half years now. The sun shines. My daughter and I walk hand in hand. Don't get me wrong, there are cloudy days. But when it rains, my daughter has an umbrella and she knows how to use it. The umbrella is the key, not the weather. First, I had to accept my daughter's emotional problems. Then I had to accept and believe that they were real. Then I had to make a commitment to give whatever it took at whatever cost. And, and, and so we begin with this idea that if we lean into this journey, it can provide us a richer, deeper, more fulfilling relationship and life. And we can learn to hear what our children are trying to tell us. The very first principle, and, and, and this is gonna be woven throughout what I have to say tonight, is that we have to keep our fear in check. Any of us, upon finding out that our child is, is harming themselves, are going to experience fear, like this father said, most of all fear. 
But if we react from that place and out of that place, our child will know that we're not the safe person to talk to. The simple illustration that I use to show this is this. If, if, if I came to you and I shared something that I was struggling with or something that I was ashamed of, and your response was to gasp in anxiety and fear like this. <gasps> if that was your reaction to what I was sharing, I would immediately know that you're not the safe person to talk to, that I need to talk to somebody who can regulate their own emotions, who can respond to me with curiosity. So the first thing we have to realize, first thing we have to pay attention to is that our fearful reaction in the moment, which could happen to any of us, can oftentimes be a barrier to the first steps in this process. I've said this story, in fact, when I was there a few years ago, I might have told this, this same story, but it, it still informs me to this day. My, my mother-in-law, my wife's mother, was a school teacher her entire career. And after she read my first book, The Journey of the Heroic Parent, she came to me one day and she said, you should go teach teachers about children and their struggles today. And I thought about it for a minute and I thought, you know, if I was going to go teach teachers, which I've done many times since, I wouldn't teach them about children. I would teach them how to listen. And then the children would tell the teachers all that the teachers need to know. So the first skill that we have to develop is our ability to deeply listen, to listen without judgment, to listen without um, an agenda. I, I wrote in my new book that to understand somebody, you have to lose your mind. It was a playful way of saying that's how far outside of our own context, our own beliefs, our own paradigm, our own life, we have to get to be able to hear our children. They're trying to tell us something consciously or unconsciously. In most cases, it's unconscious. They're trying to tell us something very painful and dramatic. And if we can learn to listen to them, then we can become a safe place for them to work it out. I want to, before I get into some of the pra practical aspects, I want to use this analogy to, to illustrate my point. I talk about often this idea that before we try to change behavior, it would be valuable for us to listen to what the behavior is trying to tell us. Because if we focus on behavioral change, this is very important. If we simply focus on behavioral change, the child can learn to hide it, can learn to avoid punishment or reaction. And somewhere else, in their lives, that unexpressed emotion or pain is gonna crop up, gonna come up somewhere else. Imagine if you built a fortress around yourself. Imagine somebody builds a wall around themselves, a fortress around themselves to protect themselves from perceived or real threats, it doesn't matter. And then somebody came to this person who had built this wall, this fortress, and they brought with them a jackhammer, a chisel, a hammer, tools to kind of dismantle the wall. What would you do if somebody was trying to break down the wall that you had built to protect yourself? I've never heard anybody get this, answer this question any other way. If somebody was trying to break down the wall that you had built to protect yourself, you would immediately build it higher, thicker, you would reinforce the wall. Our symptoms are like that. Our symptoms are like this thing that we do to prevent greater suffering. It doesn't make sense to us because to most of us, cutting and self-harm would cause greater pain. But for these children, that act of cutting is a, a, a better pain, if you will. Sometimes they actually don't feel it because they dissociate from it. And I'll talk about that a little bit later. But that act of self-harm is in some ways less painful, less unbearable than the authentic suffer that they might be experiencing at school, at home, with some kind of abuse, with some kind of anxiety or discomfort. So we learn 
How do we get the person to lower down the walls? We learn to ask questions and talk. We, we set down our tools that are meant to dismantle the wall that they built and we learn to listen. Here's another really important point before I get into, again, some of the very practical aspects of this. If you try to tear down somebody's wall, you leave them worse off than before in many ways, more vulnerable. But when they can take down the rocks, the stones, the bricks, the barriers themselves, then they do it in a way that feels safe. Here's a key. And almost every person that is expressing themselves through self-harm, cutting, there's some kind of trauma. It, it can be dramatic trauma, the more obvious traumas like abuse, or it can be more subtle traumas like not fitting in or having a learning disability that makes you feel uncomfortable at school or, or, or bullying or a parent who's yelling. It could be anything anywhere on the continuum. And so if we focus on the symptom, the symptom wins because the symptom is put there in place to distract them. This is important. The symptom is in place to distract them and us and everybody else from the authentic pain, the authentic suffering, the authentic wound. So we learn to listen. We learn to try to hear what the behavior is telling us. And I'll talk about some practical tools as, as we go. And what this is gonna require of us is to manage and deal with our, our anxiety and our fear somewhere else. I, I don't have time to talk about fear and anxiety for an entire hour, although I could talk about it all night long and into tomorrow. But I will simply say it this way. If you don't take care of your pain, your fear as a parent, your sadness at your child's behavior, then your interactions with the child will serve to take care of you and not them. Let me say that again to be clear. If you don't take care of your fear, your pain, your discomfort, your distress, then your interactions with your child, even a child that's self-harming, will serve to protect you and take care of you, not them. So you go to experts, you go to groups, you go to your community, you go to people that can sit and listen to you. I mean, that's one of the great the great pains of this time we're in with the pandemic is that we can't sit together as often as we could when, when we didn't have the pandemic. So you find a place to take care of you so that when you come back, back to the child, your interactions will serve to take care of them. So that's an overview of kind of the psychology leading into it. But let me talk about some of the more practical aspects that, that people want to know about. I'm gonna start a little bit with suicide and then I'm gonna visit it a little bit early. The first thing to say is that suicide and self-harm are not the same thing. The desire for suicide is to die. And self-harm serves a lot of other purposes that I'm gonna talk about in just a moment. There is some overlap and I'll talk about that a little later and I'll even talk about how you can assess where your child is on that continuum. But, but first and foremost, I want to say that just because you learn or discover that your child is self-harming or that a child that you know is self-harming doesn't necessarily equate to them wanting to end their life. So why do people self-harm? Like was mentioned earlier, it can be a way to feel something. A lot of people, when they experience trauma, learn to dissociate, to numb themselves out, to not feel. And so ironically, cutting on yourself, which is the most common form of self-harm that we see, cutting on yourself can bring you back to your presence, can bring you, bring you back to the experience of, of being alive. One of the things that's common in trauma, almost every trauma is a loss of control. So if you've been abused or you lost a loved one, we were just talking about before we started about 
people that we've lost during COVID. I've, I've lost somebody in my, in my family from COVID. And it's outside of my control. So one of the things that cutting does is it takes back control. I now can control my feelings and my own pain. So there's a sense of, of powerlessness and hopelessness that often is, is beneath the cutting, that the cutting serves to restore. And while it might not make sense to our rational minds, that's why I go back to the, the saying in, in my book that sometimes we have to lose our minds to understand. It's not necessarily logical to us, but in, in, in their minds, it makes sense. Sometimes it's not safe to express anger outwards. This is a really important aspect. And so when anger doesn't have a safe place to breathe, to walk around, to fly, then young people or folks are inclined to turn that anger inward. But here's the most interesting, I think, and ins insidious part of that. Who do you love the most in the world? And for me, if you're like me, tied for first, who you love the most in the world is your children. So in a way, it's a way of also not just hurting themselves, but hurting you. Without all of the stigma that comes along from acting out violently towards other people. When we see people act out, steal, bully, hurt other people, we have a, a feeling inside that they're clearly doing the wrong thing. But self-harm, while still an act of violence towards oneself, and by extension toward the people that love this person, is still a, a, a kind of violence. It's still a kind of acting out but it doesn't come with that stigma. It tends to evoke pity and fear, which again, leads to them feeling in control, right? They're not now being terrorized. It's not conscious. They might not even be doing it in the presence or in the home with the person who caused the trauma, but they're now in control of the entire dynamic. You see? So it can be self-hatred -hat turned inward, but by extension, it can be hurting you. For me, the greatest threat in my life would be if somebody wanted to hurt one of my four children. And that includes one of my four children, meaning if they were the ones doing the hurting, but it's a way for them to take, take back that power. Sometimes they're punishing themselves because of intense shame and guilt. If they are, are abused, if they're bullied, if they don't fit in, Right? If their self-worth suffers, if they think they deserve it, cutting or self-harming can be a way to kind of uh, create an, an equalizing feeling. And there's even traditions, as you know, there's been traditions across cultures through all recorded history where people will physically punish themselves from a place of shame or guilt. So that's not new to us. It can distract you from the more authentic pain. Earlier, we talked about the idea of cutting yourself to feel something. But another aspect of it, if I'm hurting physically, then I don't have to think about the deeper, more authentic pain. A famous psychologist once said this. He said that neuroses, or just think of, just think of him saying mental health issues, everyday run-of-the-mill run mental health issues, that neuroses is a substitute for legitimate suffering. Again, we might watch somebody doing something self-defeating or self-harming and say they're causing themselves more distress and more pain, but that's better than the authentic suffering. Sigmund Freud called it, um, he called it little dramas. People create little dramas in their lives so everybody will focus their attention on that. It's kind of like a bank robber uh, setting off a, something, some kind of event far away from the bank so that everybody goes over there and then the bank robber can get into the bank. That's what, that's what cutting is like. If I can get you to focus on that, then we won't have to deal with the authentic suffering. And that is why, as we talk about 
talking and listening and asking questions, we have to manage our own fear and anxiety. Because if our fear and anxiety is, is, is high, if our nervous system is upregulated, right? Our nervous system is on alert. We can't be rational. We can't be calm. We lose access to the most logical parts of ourselves. So it becomes a wonderful distraction, not just, not just for the person suffering from the behavior of self-harm, but it becomes a distraction for everybody around them. There are several aspects of self-harm that are, of course, that have a chemical reaction in our brain. And I won't go into all of those, but suffice to say that there are plenty of theories that suggest that there is an, an endorphin or that there's a compensatory behavior in our bodies when we experience pain. You've probably heard of the runner's high, or maybe you've just experienced, the runner's high is a lot like after a good long cry. I'm sure everybody listening to this has had, a, had one good, long, serious, deep cry. And you know that feeling of relief that you feel afterwards? Almost kind of a feeling of well-being. That can be the effect of it. So there's this, there's this chemical reaction that can become addictive, can become addictive, right? Something you seek after over and over again that is like that, that endorphin or that cortisol or that serotonin um, surge that we feel that gives us a sense of, 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 of relax, say, you know, safety and, and well-being. So there can be a chemical relief. By the way, as a note, estimated, when does it become addictive? Which means that you can do it with the, with the smallest of triggers, somewhere around the 30th cut. Researchers uh, suggest that that's when it can often become addictive. Some of the questions are, you know, is this can be this, this be learned from music, from from movies, from others? Um, the answer is yes, but it won't take root if there's not a, a, a predisposition, either neurologically or trauma-wise to it. So, in other words, you could be exposed to it through songs, through movies, through peer groups, through media through stories in the news, all of that. But if you don't have a predisposition chemically, neurologically, a genetic predisposition, or you don't have a, a significant trauma, it most likely won't take root. So it's almost like an activating event. It, it can be this thing. Some people ask, is it a stage? Possibly but the risks are too great. And because the message is so important to listen to and to pay attention to, treating it simply like it's a stage and ignoring it is too risky. How do you spot it? Um, watch for clothes that don't fit the weather. Watch for long sleeve clothes. Watch for them covering themselves in situations where they would normally be uncovered if they're extra secretive about their, their bodies. If you find blood on clothing, that can be a sign. Um, if, they re, if they are reluctant for no reason that you can indicate to go to their doctor's visit, that can be a sign. If you find things, most the most common form of self-harm is cutting. So if you're finding blades, razor blades, scissors, sharp objects sitting on the windowsill, sitting next to their bed, sitting on their, on their bedside table, those are signs that you can start to ask questions. And I'll talk about how to start the, 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 the process of asking questions. Do you have medical supplies that, that are, are going missing or are you finding gauze or bandages in their room or in their waste, waste basket? If they're telling you stories or you hear stories, of friends harming, that's a really significant indication that they might be involved in that behavior too. Sometimes they will even highlight and even talk in a negative light about other people that are self-harming while they, while they themselves are self-harming. 
So again, it can lead to you asking simple questions. One of the things that they talk about is a change in behavioral patterns, um, change of friends. That can be difficult because it's also present developmentally. Sometimes as people grow up, those patterns change and it can also be related to other mental health issues. So that's just one thing that if you see in the context of some of these other behaviors that I've described, the medical supplies, the bloody clothing, the covering up, the refusal to go to the doctor, that you would start to make sense out of it. And then of course, if you see something visibly, if you see something on their wrists, on their ankles, oftentimes somebody who's self-harming, it could go both ways. Sometimes they'll do it out in the open. And, and we think that those that are doing it out in the open are, are, are looking at some point to have a discussion about it. But oftentimes they, they go to great lengths to hide it. They go to lengths to hide it in places on their body where virtually nobody except for a medical doctor would see it. So if you see something on the risk, wrist that doesn't look like it could, could have been put there naturally, right? You see three lines, for example, three scratches or a series of scratches. That can be something that's an indication. Now, so, you, so some of these comes up, what does the conversation look like? The first thing I wanna say is it's really important that you are co-regulated, co-regulating. Everybody who has a child knows what it's like when that young toddler falls, right? Or they're riding a bike and they, they tip over on their bike. And what do they do? They so often look at us to see if they're safe, to see if, if it's worthy of crying. And I, I think every parent, probably every adult around children has the experience of watching a child look to the closest adult, the closest authority figure in their life, when they stub their toe or scratch their knee or fall over on their bike, look to us to see if it's safe or if there's something to be alarmed about. The same way you would, if you walked into a hospital room where somebody that you cared about was in an accident, if your face was to look frightened and aghast, that person would probably be more and more upset and more and more anxious. So before I even talk about what to say, it's important that you are down-regulated. In other words, that your nervous system is relatively relaxed. If it's up-regulated, take a time up. The biggest mistake that you can make with some of these conversations is time and place. Doing it at a time and place when you feel safe, when there's no other distractions, when you're as calm as you can possibly be, those are all strong indicators of, of, of the likelihood of a successful discussion. The conversation is simple. How long have you been cutting? How often do you cut? Where do you cut? Do you know why you cut? What's the motivation? Do you try to limit it? Have you ever tried to stop before? What happened when you tried to stop? Those are pretty simple, straightforward questions. And the experts in all the books that I've read about it and in our own program, the way we do it, is just to be very matter of fact about it, which is very hard to do when you love them, but it will make a difference. It's important underneath what you say that you validate how uncomfortable the conversation might be, especially if they resist it. And by the way, we know that oftentimes the first or the second conversation won't go well. I wanna state that as clearly as I can. It might take you two or three or four times to have the discussion. You might get to a point where you give up after several attempts. And I'll talk about that a little later and about getting expert help. But validate the, the, the discomfort in the discussion or how they might feel ashamed or awkward about it. And just state the behavior. I saw some scratches on your ankle some cuts on your hand, on your wrist that didn't look like they came from something naturally. They'll often make excuses for it, of course. And then state your concerns, but state them, this is gonna sound strange, almost crazy, state them lightly. Too much, again, suggests to them that you need to be taken care of. 
it's a really simple idea. You know, we psychologists, we talk all the time about how children are, are asked to take care of their parents. And most parents that I talk to say to me, you're crazy. What are you talking about? What do you mean my child takes care of me? That doesn't make any sense. What we mean by that is if you come with big emotions, the child thinks that they need to behave in such a way to calm you down as if they're responsible for your emotions. So if you come at them with a great deal of, of fear and angst and anxiety and frustration and anger and disappointment, the natural trigger for them, the natural thought process is that they have to behave in such a way, which includes lying, hiding, so that you're not upset. So it's very important that you state your con concerns, but that you do it lightly. We don't give them our feelings to take care of. We let our feelings inform us, but we don't give them to a child who's struggling with what's, what's probably uh, 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 some kind of uh, trauma or anxiety. We don't do that, ideally. We go over there, wherever there is, your support group. We go over there to take care of ourselves so that we, when, when, we, when we come back here, our interactions are in support of the child, not, not, not of us. It doesn't matter the specifics of the conversation so much. The general principle is that you just keep talking about it. It's okay to take timeouts. Ex experts suggest we do it all the time where we make an initial attempt to the discussion and then we come back to it a day or two or a few days later. And then it's important that you reassure them and that you can, as long as they're not, uh, their life is not at risk, as long as they're not a suicide risk, you make, you make reassurances to them and you let them know that you'll talk about plans. So that's some of the practical thing. Let me talk about some other concepts. The most important thing is to be a safe person. I, we know two things from the research. We know very, very well. Number one, we know that a healthy attachment for a child, which is a parent or a caregiver, who gives the child the experience that they are safe and welcomed, that that's the number one predictor of resilience. We know that. It's across cultures, across socioeconomic statuses, across the globe. We know that creating a safe and welcoming environment for a child is the number one, number one thing that contributes to their resiliency. That's the first thing we know. The second thing we know is that the best predictor of our ability to do this is our self-knowledge. I, I teach this to therapists and parents all the time. For example, if you don't know that you have an anxiety disorder, which most of us have a little bit of it, if you don't know what your mental illness issues are, because everybody has a little, right? It's not black and white. It's not either you're healthy or you're ill. It's more like a continuum and we're all on it. If you don't know what your issues are and how they impact the people that you care about, your children, your spouse, and the people that you serve professionally will suffer. That is clear. So we know that providing a safe and welcoming environment for a child is the number one contribution we can make to resilience. And the second thing is how well we know ourselves which includes, by the way, knowing our own childhood, our own upbringing and the impact that it has on us. Sometimes people tell me when I teach this, they say, well, I had a really good childhood. And the research doesn't suggest that that makes any difference in the world. Isn't that amazing? Let me say that again. People will often challenge me on this idea that they had a good childhood. And I tell them, the research does not support 
that that makes any difference in your ability to provide a safe and welcoming environment for the child. You have to know yourself. You have to find out how your anxiety, you know, do you have anxiety and how does that affect the child? See, sometimes the child interprets the parent's anxiety as that something's wrong with them. In fact, cutting can be related to that very idea of a parent's anxiety. What we've learned from researching young people today is that there are many young people who don't experience big T trauma. We call it big T and small T trauma, like the more, the more classic examples of abuse, but just the, the normal going through life trauma that every, everybody experiences, disappointments, peers that you don't get along with, getting yelled at by a parent, whatever it is, typical everyday kinds of things, a parent working too much, whatever it is. But with, with these children, it's critical, important that we can provide a safe place for them to discover whatever that is and talk about that. And if we, going back to the behavior, if the focus is on behavior, if the, if the focus is working on, that's the whole shift in, in, in tonight's self-harm and, and everything that I teach. You're not trying to stop behavior from happening. Ironically, you're not trying to stop cutting in a sense. You're not trying to stop if your child has a substance use issue. You're not trying to get them to stop drinking in a sense. That doesn't work in, in many cases. What you're trying to do is you're trying to get them to do something else instead, which is to talk about it, to deal with it, to develop skills, to deal with that umbrella that the gentleman at the top of my broadcast talked about. It's not the weather, he said because they're gonna face all kinds of weather. As you all know, it's the umbrella. The kinds of therapy that if you're looking for a therapist, for an expert, the kinds that typically people will, will, the research suggests that this is the most effective at working with it is cognitive behavioral therapy, which is looking at distorted and exaggerated thinkings that come from, um, that, are, that are involved in mood disorders like depression and bipolar or something called dialectical behavioral therapy. Dialectical behavioral therapy looks at four things. How to regulate emotions, how to self-soothe, and to challenge distorted thinkings, the distorted thoughts, like everybody hates me, or all men are mean, or I'm worthless, or I can't do anything right. So regulating emotions by self-soothing and challenging distorted thinkings. That's a, that's a cognitive behavioral idea within the context of dialectical behavior. Distress tolerance, how to learn to tolerate and sit with uncomfortable feelings. The person who's self-harming will virtually do anything to get out of that authentic suffering. So learning to feel, learning that it's temporary, is a part of dialectical behavioral therapy. Mindfulness is a really important part of it. I started at the top of the broadcast. Do you remember when I said, if you can just lean into today, even if you're in the middle of a difficult situation, if you can, if you can just practice thinking the idea that what is happening is what should be happening and it's there to teach you something, all you're doing is you're modeling the exact same thing that they're gonna be treating, that they're gonna get in treatment, which is to lean into the feeling to be present with your emotions. See, every addiction or symptom, this is kind of a cool idea, every addiction or symptom could be understood to be an attempt to not be present in our own life. So mindfulness, sometimes thought of as meditation, although it doesn't have to be, but it's a way of just radically accepting the circumstances and dealing with them. So there's mindfulness training with dialectical behavioral therapy. And then finally, skills training, like assertiveness, being able to get you what you want, being able to communicate and to listen to other people, developing skills that help you in relationships, develop more stability in relationships. So if you're going to a therapist, ask them questions about how much self-harm they work with, what models they use. Remember, 
it's really important that you're able to ask and interview providers, treatment providers, and ask them. I always say clients, mental health clients and their parents have the right to ask difficult questions and get intelligent answers. So cognitive behavioral therapy and dialectical behavioral therapy are the modes most commonly associated with chronic self-harm. What happens if it's not working at home? Let me give you some, some things to look at if hospitalization is necessary. If they're unable over a period of time to keep themselves safe. If the self-harm is causing serious harm, heavy bleeding, emergency room visits, stitches, medical care outside of the home. If they're unable to stop for more than a day. If the, the self-harming behavior is an, is an eminent risk that it could be um, accidentally or by extension a threat to their life. If they're unable to engage in conversations with you over a long period of time and, and speak rationally with you and their impulses are, are high, they don't have insight before their behavior, that's a sign they might need hospitalization. And then of course, if they start expressing suicidality, hospitalization would be recommended. When not to have hospitalization, if they're able to engage in conversations and treatment with a professional at home, if they're able to make commitments and follow through. I'm not talking about perfectionism. In fact, I thought this would be helpful tonight. Perfectionism, any of you know about that? I, I know I know something about that. Perfectionism is a characteristic that is associated with self-harm. So if you're a perfectionist, you might have passed it on. If they're a perfectionist, that could be an indication that could be along with the, the other evidences that I described, a predisposition to self-harm. Are they able to openly discuss, discuss self-injury and their urges? Can they stick to a therapy plan? Are they developing other coping skills like talking, meditation, mantras? Are there various tasks and techniques that dialectical behavioral therapists will, will offer, for example? Do they comply with therapy, with, with going to therapy, with showing up? And then of course, if they're not expressing suicidality. How do you know if it's crossed the threshold? Let me share, read this statistic. About 50 to 80% of people that cut engage at some point in suicidal behavior. That's a pretty high number. About 28 to 41% of those who self-injure experience suicidal thoughts. So it's not the same thing, but they overlap. So what you're looking for is four things. Think of the acronym SLAP, S-L-A-P. Do they have a specific plan? How lethal is the plan? In other words, some kids will say, well, I'm just going to jump off the roof. That's not a very lethal plan if you live in my house, at my house, Right. Um, do they have access to the thing that can, can end their life? Do they have access to a weapon? Obviously they can do something, you know, do they have access to drugs? Do they have access to objects that can hurt themselves? And then how much support and help do they have? What's the proximity of help? So specific plan, how lethal is their plan? How accessible is the, the implements that can, can cause death? And then how much support do they have? How much support do you have? In general, your goal is to talk and listen. Listen, and by the way, this goes for, I have no idea who's listening. I have no idea how many of you that are listening, but I can say this with great confidence. You can learn to listen better. Doesn't matter who you are. Doesn't matter if there's thousands of people listening to me. You can learn to listen better. You can learn to listen to what they're unable to say. Understanding what their triggers and their risk factors are. Do they have a trauma story that you know about? Are they being exposed to triggers in the home and then get help? Talk to a professional. 
If your child won't talk to you, it's time to make sure that you have a professional that you can talk to that can guide you through, through the process. I love this ending quote and then I'll take any questions. Keep in mind, somebody writes, keep in mind that your child is not deliberately trying to make your life more difficult. She is genuinely suffering and may be terribly afraid about what will happen if she opens up to you. This is not a bad behavior situation. This is not a slap on the wrist. It's not about getting them in trouble. This is a sign of a mental illness issue. Some people wonder, is my child doing it for attention? It doesn't matter. You give it attention. You learn their story where this, this behavior makes sense and you might need some support doing it. So at the end of the day, what, if I could offer you anything, it's this. I've, I've shared some skills. The, some of what I took from is a book that we recommend to our parents when we have a child that's self-injuring. It's called When Your Child is Cutting. You can look it up. The name of the authors are hard to pronounce, but the name of the book is When, when Your Child is Cutting. It has three authors to it. Um, you have a parallel you have a parallel project. You have to work on your nervous system regulation. You have to learn to be a safe person. You have to learn to look at what your mental health issues are because we all have them. You have to look at your anxiety and how it's getting communicated and you have to take care of that somewhere else. I, I wanna tell you, we're all in this together. I'm not immune from it because I have skills or tools or education. My children, my four children have struggled in various ways over the years. But what we have is we have a bridge, right? This knowledge, this awareness, these tools offer me a bridge. Just last night I was lecturing to another group and I was telling my 13 year old daughter, she's my youngest of four. I was telling her, I was telling her, Olivia, I have to do a, a parent uh, lecture this evening. And she said to me, I feel really sorry for the folks that are listening to you for parenting, which I thought was beautiful. And I said, you know, that's, that's true. I kind of feel sorry for them sometimes too, that they're relying on me. But what I teach them is that I don't have the source of all the answers and all the truth, but they do. My expertise and the expertise of the therapeutic world is not giving you all the answers. We have some tools some access to some research and some theories, but you have it in you. You have what you need in you. You just need to be in a place that can help you find it. And in the end, I have treated thousands of children and their families, thousands of children and their families who have struggled with self-harm in various forms and other mental health issues and, and, and substance abuse issues. And I will tell you this, I look up to all of them. They're my heroes. When I was out in the wilderness in our program, we run a wilderness program. When I was out in the wilderness last week with all the young people, I was visiting the various groups. I was telling them that I said, you're just struggling and you have great gifts to offer to the world. And if we can help you kind of get to where you need to go, you're going to be able to help people that other people can't help. And that's who these children are deeply feeling powerfully insightful people inside. I don't know if there are any questions. I do. I wasn't looking, but I can look at some. Yes. Yeah, so there is a Q and A chat. Um, I don't know if you see it. You see it? Somebody says how to get control of my life back if my experience of the past six years of not more things happen the way, no matter how hard I work to achieve my goal. I'm not sure I understand that. Well, she, then she continues. She says, "I am that child." I think she says, I, I've grown up um, and still cutting myself. Had one suicide attempt in the past. You, you can't do it on your own. I mean, you have to find somebody, you know, you have to find somebody that you trust. You have to find somebody. I, I will tell all of you, if, if you've learned nothing else, know that dialectical behavioral therapy is the therapy of choice. So sign, and sometimes it's called DBT, 
Find somebody who has experience in DBT, dialectical behavioral therapy. It's got a wonderful combination of practical skills and what I would call a, a spiritual kind of awareness of like your feelings, like to, to know and sit with and be present with your feelings. It's a, it's a, it's a wonderful combination. So it's finding somebody, but you're never too late. It's never too late. You know, you know, when you're done with your journey because you don't wake up in the morning and until then there's still opportunities to learn for all of us. We're never done. In fact, this is another lecture altogether. When I meet somebody who has learned everything that there is to learn or has arrived, those kind of people I don't like to be around. I like to be around people that are still learning. So there's still something to, to learn. And if you need a referral for a good therapist, um, you can call Operation Survival. I'm posting the, the number on the chat. You can contact Operation Survival and get referral for some good therapists. And how often is it, someone says, how often does it happen to other avenues besides cutting? Burning can happen sometimes, head banging. Sometimes we, we associate self-harm most often with the version of self-harm that is not compulsive, meaning that there's some conscious choice in the act. The, the head banging, sometimes pulling out one's hair, um, picking at your skin, those tend to be unconscious and are associated with mental, other mental health issues. That's the most common answer. Um, but most often the kind of cutting and self-harm that we're talking about is, is associated with um, some mood issues, some post-traumatic stress disorder. But again, there's, there's, some, there's some consciousness in the act. It's not just picking unconsciously or pulling out your hair unconsciously or, or, or doing something like that, but it's most often cutting. I would say off the top of my head, anecdotally, of the kids that come to our program that we would call self-harming, oh, more than 90% involve cutting. Um, there's another question here. What's your thoughts on somatic therapy and self-harm? I love somatic therapy. We have several DBT therapists in my program. We have several that work in the somatic, um, using somatic therapy for their, for, their, uh, for their approach. I've sat in sessions where my trained therapists who are experts in somatic work do it in front of me. I think it's wonderful. If talk therapy, because not everybody thinks and expresses themselves the same way. So if you find barriers for talk therapy, then somatic experiencing, that's what it's called, can be wonderful, which is learning to tune into how your body feels. There's a great book called The Body Keeps the Score by a famous psychologist, and he talks about this at length. So if you want to look at that, um, am I saying it right? Uh, yeah. Yeah, it's Russell Dr. Van 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 Der Kolk. Kolk. I know, I always have trouble pronouncing his name. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want to take the risk because I didn't have it written down, but The Body Keeps the Score is a wonderful, wonderful book. If you, if you tend to tune into body feelings more than, than I do, I do most verbally. Any other questions you want me to? In the Q&A, do you see there's, there are more questions? Uh, um, doesn't that negate expressing empathy? I think that that came about when you were talking about um, asking the question, like being very direct. Oh, the person, so with the question maybe that they're asking that because I'm being so direct and straightforward that there's a lack of feeling or empathy in it. Maybe you think that's what the question is? Possibly. Um, I, I mean, I was giving you kind of the, the, the nuts and bolts but absolutely, the very first thing I said principally is show compassion and validate their feelings. Talk about how awkward it is. Talk about how they might feel awkward about it. Talk about how scared you are to make a mistake, whatever it is. The only thing not to do is, is to not talk. It's a, creating a dialogue is most important. It's okay if you make mistakes. I make, I make enough mistakes that my children have a regular experience of me needing to apologize. And honestly, I can't think of anything, I would list that on the top five things that a parent could do for a child to help their emotional health is to learn to apologize for your mistakes. Not that I would direct you to make mistakes on, pro on purpose, but find examples to make mistakes. So you definitely want to express validation, understanding, and even you're allowed to talk about your own discomfort, but that you're willing and it's important to walk through it and to have those very simple, straightforward conversations. 
I just want to throw in because somebody wrote this in the in the chat um, when you spoke about somatic experience, of which I am a big fan, um, and we do it with students at school, and it's extremely effective. Um, somebody mentioned the book Self Regulation Training by Dr. Reggie Melrose. I am a huge Reggie Melrose fan. I have yeah. staff members who've taken her trainings. She's the best of the best. There's another book by her. I'm posting these these books. Wonderful. There's Seconds Fix. Um, really like a handbook on training um, in somatic experience that anybody can use. It's extremely user-friendly. I give it to teens to read and they, and, and it's phenomenal. Um, so Somebody says, what can I do if I tend to freeze? Well, that's a trauma response, right? Fight, flight, freeze, or fawn. Fawn is, is pleasing behaviors. And so it's okay. That just means you're having a trauma response. And so, like I mentioned earlier, that means you probably need some help from an expert to talk about that, that trauma response before you can have a conversation. There's no, there's no shame in that. I, if I can, I just want to say one thing to all of you. Again, we all have mental health issues. It's only the pe person who thinks that they don't have any mental health issues that's the dangerous person. Everybody struggles with something. So if you have a freeze response to triggers like a child self-harming, there's no shame in that. That just means you need help first. Sometimes somatic work can help. I know brain spotting has worked. We, we have several that are certified in brain spotting. David Grand wrote a book on brain spotting. And again, we're just talking about other theories and other approaches, but oftentimes brain spotting can help you get out of a trauma response. Also. Okay, another question that's in the um, question, the Q&A chat. Um, what are your thoughts on a child who's 16 who has replaced cutting with marijuana? And if she doesn't have marijuana, she goes back to cutting. My, 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 I guess my thought is that it's the same symptom. It's self-sabotaging, self-destructive behavior and it's their only way of coping. I mean, remember, self-harm is coping. It's not healthy coping. It can lead to addictive patterns, but it's the same with marijuana. And so all she's doing is just exchanging one symptom for another. Again, when, when, I, when I get a child in my treatment, in my care, I listen to their symptom description. In fact, I was talking to my wife today about this, who's also a therapist, about this talk, just going over some of this with her. And um, there are specific tools and skills and concepts, concepts in each field, but so often it's the same thing. You're trying to listen to what the symptom is trying to tell you. And that takes practice. That takes self-regulation. That takes um, uh, an ability to listen more deeply. I have this saying, I almost said this earlier, but I saw the time, but we're going over, so I'll say it now. I have this saying about teenagers in our program. And my saying is, um, Teenagers are always telling you the truth if you listen well enough. Even when they're lying, they're telling you the truth. It's, a, it's almost as if you're listening to them tell you about your dreams. You know, what we know about our dreams is that our dreams are our unconscious self talking to us, and it's always telling the truth. The problem isn't that our dreams are lying to us. The problem is that we don't know how to interpret them. So find somebody that can help you interpret it. Find somebody that can help you listen and realize that no matter what your child is telling you, they're telling you some truth that they can't express. Even a lie has in it some truth that is unexpressed. The question about a parent, keep trying, be relentless, but be patient in a child that won't open up. So ask several times, assure them of your reaction. If you get too anxious and too pressing, if you, like I said, with, with, the, with the, the, the wall that was built, if you try to pry it open too forcefully, then they're likely to become more and more defended. So keep trying, give them space. Um, eventually, this is what we would recommend. Eventually, if they're non-responsive, I, I can't say this more emphatically. You go to a therapist who helps parents deal with these issues. Simple as can be. 
You'll say, well, I don't have the mental health issue. Doesn't matter. Your child is in need of resources that you're lacking, in need, need of uh, skills that you're lacking, in need of something that you might not be lacking. So you have to go somewhere else to get that. So if your child eventually won't respond to your patient, but consistent attempts to talk, go to a professional and get help and guidance there. I don't know if I would do the same thing. I would do the same thing. Even as an educated person in this field, I talk to, I have a therapist of 22 years that I see every Friday at 11 a.m. Mountain Time. So find support and resources for yourself. Okay. There are more questions in the chat, but um, Brad, tell me if you are prepared to answer more questions. I could take a couple of more if people are open to it. Okay. Um, first of all, we have, wow, such an amazing presentation. So informative, helpful, beautifully presented. Thank you, Dr. Reedy. Thank you. Um, yes, there is a recording. There will be a recording on YouTube um, of this session. Um, I'm just looking, I saw another question. Suggestions for a child with no motivation to attend therapy responds with one to two word answers when engaged in conversation. It's similar to the question about if, if you can't get a child to talk or open up, first go to a professional and then the professional can guide you. At some point, if the behavior is consistent or escalating and the child won't talk, you might need to take a, you might need to escalate the intervention, meaning hospitalization or something outside of the home. I, I, I wouldn't go there right away, but if that's why, see, if you were my client, any of you were my client, we would talk about this. We would work our way through it. And you would, with my support, come to the decision that you need to make if it needed to escalate to another level. All right, and then there was one more. Um, Oh, you wrote, you wrote something wonderful. Somatic therapy requires little or no talking. If they will go to somebody who practices somatic experiencing, wonderful. Yeah. Finding somebody else, great. If they'll do that, that's great. Right. Um, and then what do you feel about using 12 steps and their fellowships, Emotions Anonymous? Well... I guess I can end with that one. I, I love the 12 steps because the 12 steps are just, they're about shame. They're about a relationship with your higher power. And I'm a big fan of that and helping somebody to, to um, create a, a, a resource for serenity and peace and, and faith and, and what's happening in the world. Um, it's a mindfulness activity in a lot of ways. The 12 steps invite us to pay attention to what our body is feeling. What I say to people is the 12 steps can be effective, especially when things become habitual. Therapy and some of these skills can often work that we've talked about, CBT, DBT can work, but sometimes the structure of 12 steps is an immersion into a culture that has built-in support, built-in accountability, built-in rituals and practices that encourage good mental health. And so when I work with somebody who's demonstrating compulsive behaviors, we try all of the things that I've described tonight. And then if in the end they say, I still at times resort to this kind of compulsive behavior, then I said, then I will say, you might need structure that's more um, systematic that will help you maintain um, sobriety, if you will, sobriety from the harmful behaviors. All right. Okay, um, Dr. Reedy, I cannot thank you enough. This has been incredibly um, informative and helpful and eye-opening. And I'm sure that so many people are just taking in the, the practical information that you've given and ready to, to jump in and start making it work for themselves and their families. Um, this, the recording of tonight's session is available on Operation Survival's YouTube channel. Um, I'm just looking to see if there are any more, any more questions or comments that need to be addressed. Can I say something complimentary toward you? Sure. <laughs> you folks are doing, I mean, this is not the first time I've, I've, I've spoken to, to, to your group. What I admire about you guys is you're doing the work 
that we all say that we should be doing, which is having a discussion, bringing it to the community. Um, we all struggle. Everybody struggles and we need each other. And hiding away and making our pain private doesn't work. Doesn't work for me. Doesn't work for you. Doesn't work for the people listening. And so I, I just have a, a, a lot of gratitude for being at all associated with a group who's committed to continuing to create discussions that the community needs. So it's just an honor to be here. So I, I hope it's helpful and thank you for being able to participate and be around you. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's our honor and our pleasure. I want to announce the dates for the upcoming events. We have, God willing, April, sorry, oops. Um, April 30th, we have Intimacy, What Do I Tell My Daughter? We have April 27th, Eating Disorders, Who is Affected? And May 4th, Trauma, Signs That Your Child May Need Help With, with Trauma. So make sure to tune into those events. They're on the flyer, the same flyer that we had for tonight's event, but more flyers will be sent out in the future. I want to wish everybody a wonderful evening, a meaningful Bayes ER and wonderful month of healing and good mental, physical health. Thank you and good night. Thank you.